Ladies and gentlemen, travel and tourism has been at the epicenter of the COVID crisis over the last 12 months. But this is not new to Asia. We have seen this movie before in the region and Asia Pacific is in fact a lot more used to pivoting in response to pandemics or economic threats compared to the Western world. Indeed, we bounce back stronger after 9-11, SARS, MERS, the global financial crisis and closer to home, the Asian economic crisis of the late 90s. However, the impact of COVID-19 on the tourism sector has been of a different order of magnitude. The economic contraction has been more profound than any recession since World War II. Also, somehow the previous crises were more or less regionally contained, while COVID has simultaneously engulfed the entire world in its path of destruction. On a brighter note, many of the 55 countries that make up the Asia Pacific region have been excellent examples of resilience. No surprises then that as COVID begins to lose in its grip on the world, the economies of Asia Pacific region have been amongst the first to return. Recovery has not been straightforward or uniform though. Those countries that have managed to control the spread of the virus have seen an element of demand recover, while others where cases are starting to rise again have seen restrictions reimposed. The second and perhaps more important part of recovery, which is earnings, still trails. And even with a reliable vaccination in full operation, it might be another two years before we return to business as usual. With 2021 now well underway, businesses and countries are looking to turn a new leaf. And it is in this that the region continues to draw attention. You see, Asia Pacific is 60% of the total global population. It is also the fastest growing region for wealth, making it a key location for our sector, given the positive correlation between growth of wealth and travel spend. Over the last decade, China has been the most amazing success story, but not alone. Well-established markets like Japan, South Korea, along with fast-growing ones like India and Philippines have all contributed to this success story. While domestic travel may have kept the sector afloat in Asia, the industry needs to reinvent itself until international tourism resumes in full swing. It needs greater public-private cooperation to establish and comply with health and safety standards and protocols. It needs to rebuild the trust and confidence of potential travelers. It needs close coordination among sectors such as aviation, hospitality, retail, railways, insurance. It needs investments in the sector to generate more income and employment opportunities, and it needs innovative solutions to bounce back and build future resilience. The immense potential in the travel and tourism sector in APAC is not in question. What we need to do is to build back better in the post COVID world. What can that path to recovery look like in Asia? With the financial resource and appetite for spend in Asia, will Asia be the pioneers of the new travel landscape? Will the region lead in providing the much needed bounds the industry has been waiting for? Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to a very special panel on Tales from the East, Asia Pacific's path to recovery and beyond. My name is Aradhna Koala and I'm a global expert on the travel, tourism and hospitality industries. My executive entrepreneurial and board career spans two decades five continents in 75 plus countries. I'm currently the CEO of Aptomind Partners based out of London in UK. I'm the former managing director of tourism at NEOM, and I sit on the board of multiple companies, both private and publicly listed, which among others include being the chair of the advisory board of the Red Sea Project in Saudi Arabia. And I couldn't be happier being here moderating this wonderful session because we have five heavyweights from Hong Kong, China, Japan, India, and Philippines. Now, these are individuals 
who have not just aimed to make things better. Their unwavering ambition and unrelenting commitment have in fact helped shape and amplify the work of their respective organizations and their countries by accelerating new ways of thinking about recovery. Please join me in welcoming five leaders, five superpowers from Asia, and personally for me, five superheroes. We have Panzi Ho, co-chair and executive director of MGM China Holdings, Tadashi Fujita, director and vice chairman of Japan Airlines, Puneet Chitwal, MD and CEO of Indian Hotels Company, James Liang, co-founder and executive chairman of Trip.com Group, and finally, not but not least, last but not the least, Bernadette Romulu Puyat, who's the secretary of tourism of Philippines. Thank you all so very much for being here. It's a pleasure and a privilege. Before we dig deep into the discussion, could I please ask each one of you, and it might seem like a long time ago, but as the events were unfolding last year, do you remember what was the low point for you? And what was that one thing which kept you optimistic and hopeful. It could be anything, an indicator, a personal or a professional signal that you look to, to tell yourself that this too shall pass. A very quick 30 second answer from each panelist, please. Who might like to go first? Ms. Ho. Okay. Hi, hello. So of course I'm from the region of Macau and Hong Kong, uh, which is of course part of China. So being in the region that was first affected by the pandemic, the low point as it was for many was the initial closures of businesses here in Macau and Hong Kong. Well, I'm lucky in Macau now, we are all already fully reopened. In Hong Kong, there are still a lot of restrictions because the cases are still not entirely under control. It was devastating to witness the world uh, begin to change with all these closing of international borders, halting of international travel uh, for the first time you know, in a long history. Despite, of course, huge losses and devastating impact on the sector, um, what has given me optimism um, has been how the global tourism community had stood together in solidarity. To give you a good example, um, a highlight of 2020 for myself, as well as for this region was that we managed to continue to organize our annual Global Tourism Economy Forum, which has been already um, you know, a collaboration between uh, major international tourism and travel sector organizations like WTTC and UNWTO with myself here in Macau, um, using a hybrid event uh, with in-person component in Macau and all other contents on a live stream online basis. Uh, we put together, after all, our, our major event for the year with the theme Solidarity and Innovation, Reshaping Tourism in the New Global Economy. And the event was a resounding success. There were over 420,000 viewers for the forum representing over 50 regions in the world. So. You know, I think Fantastic. with that, we can see that there's a lot of positive um, vibes still, Wonderful. you know, that we can share. Thank you. Fujita-san, you had raised your hand, please. Okay, uh, my name is Fujita from Japan Airlines. I give you a quick comment. Uh, first and foremost, uh, we focused on the survival of the company in, at the beginning and the protection of the employment. So by not lay off anyone, of our employees. Everybody is now challenging to develop their abilities through many experiences to overcome this crisis. And I believe that will lead the company to the future. Thank you. Wonderful. Madam Secretary, yes. if I can come um, to you next. Probably the toughest point for the tourism sector in the Philippines would be during the onset of the pandemic when enhanced community quarantine and travel restrictions were imposed to protect everyone from the virus. The temporary halt in the operations of non-essential industries was definitely a low point for the industry as it had drastically affected tourism 
um, and the closure of um, all the tourism establishments and the loss of jobs. In 2019, 5.7 million Filipinos had jobs because of tourism. And because of the pandemic, 4.7 million jobs were affected. So no one was prepared for this pandemic and there were no existing plans. There was no handbook on how to deal with COVID. Now, the need to assist all these affected workers and communities served as a primary motivation to pursue effective support mechanism and a concrete recovery plan. We were able to get past this phase because of what we call in Filipino the Bayanihan spirit. Bayanihan in English would be everybody working together towards a common good. We are grateful for the cooperation of all our stakeholders, partner government agencies, local government units, and institutions for sharing with us their insights, expertise, and resources that enabled us to craft the tourism response and recovery plan pertaining to the safe reopening of our tourist destinations and providing assistance to our displaced tourism workers and MSMEs. Thank you. Can I come to you, um, Ms. James Liang? Oh yeah, you're asking the lowest point. Well, the lowest point is not zero. <laughs> zero sales is not our lowest point. Well, the business quickly went down to zero, but we have negative cash flow because all of a sudden millions and millions of customers demanding refund. Mm -hmm. And the airlines are usually quite slow in providing those refunds, but we have to honor our you know, commitment to our service. So we have to give the refund to the customers. So it was an enormous pressure for our finance team to provide the financial resource to, to, to honor this uh, commitment. And also it was an enormous stress for our service team. They almost have to work around the clock uh, to be able to meet the demand for refund. So that was uh, the lowest, well, probably the most challenging point last year. Wonderful. Puneet, if I can come to you next. Yeah, I, I really like the connotation used by Madam Secretary of Bayani Hand Spirit. It's called maybe like that in Philippines, but I think all over the world in different languages, uh, the need of the hour when it uh, is warranted, the communities and people get together. For me, the lowest point was nine consecutive quarters of positive EBITDA growth, margin growth, and suddenly zero revenue. It was not like what James was saying about refunds. We came practically on 24th of March, uh, 2020, the lockdown was announced. And with that, practically 90% of our hotels were shut. What uh, kept us going was the belief of the resilience of our people. Uh, what kept us going was we got very quickly occupied in serving the medical community, the frontline staff, supplying meals, hosting them in our hotels. So somehow time passed and we thought it'll be over next month or next month or next month. So the, so the lowest point seemed always behind you. Had anyone told me on 24th of March that on 12th of April, the number of cases versus 12th of April last year will be 15 times more in India, then I think we would have given up and the resilience would not have been as strong as it has been over the last 14, 15 months. Wonderful, thank you very much. That's some incredible learning in there. And also it's a stark reminder of how bad actually things um, went down to and still are in some parts of the world. Uh, thank you all very much. Now, obviously, Asia Pacific was a region to first tackle COVID-19 directly. I would love to ask you, what is your one key learning from managing this crisis? Uh, Tanzi Ho, may I start with you, given you have firsthand experience, not only in hospitality and casinos, but also transport, real estate and retail, your key learning from managing this experience. Okay, so in now uh, part of the world, especially in my uh, line of business, we are actually considered concession operators of uh, you know, integrated resorts. So in that respect, uh, we've always had that, a good experience working directly with the government. In fact, that's you know, even our obligation, you know, that we are going to always put public interests at heart and also you know, in the front. 
So this has been a good demonstration how a good PPP model is going to be critical and you know important to help both you know the the ability of having our um, community get together and work you know alongside with the policies of the government and the corporations contributing not only in terms of financial uh, support uh, maintaining employment for our staff um, offering of course uh, even additional and incremental kind of assistance on uh, also looking after their health and mental status uh, to ensure that they would not feel that they are uh, going to be worried about losing the uh, employment or you know that they will be suffering in any way uh, financially but more important it is also that we take the initiatives also to help with the government in terms of operating all sorts of training for the um the travel sector so that they can be better equipped to cope with what is to come in the future. Um, so the theme is to investing in human capital, preserving employment, and mm -hmm. enhancing their ability to basically utilize this as a way to leapfrog into maybe, you know, growth and also you no know, future developments. Fantastic. Fujita-san, can I ask you, Japan has such a phenomenal record at dealing with all kinds of crises, natural and otherwise. What was your one key learning from managing the COVID crisis? Well, uh, as you mentioned, we have experienced several epidemics such as SARS, MERS, and swine flu pandemics. And the government in Asia has implemented solo countermeasures against uh, infectious diseases and border enforcement measures beforehand. And since then, the region has been able to keep the pandemic under control while monitoring the situation very well. In general, the residents in Asia are very sensitive to the risk of infections and sharing similar concern and have taken proactive measures to protect their health, like everybody's wearing the masks, even before the pandemics. And they share a strong sense of anxiety. So the, each government also needs to address the concern of the public and is developing careful uh, policies to avoid a shortage of a medical service due to the spread of the diseases. As a result, maybe the government are very conscious that border should not be open until the infection has subsided to some extent. And the tourism industries need to be prepared for this uh, situation. Great. Um, James, if I can bring you in at this point, we've all said we need a lot more collaboration, but we've not necessarily seen a lot of collaboration on the ground. And there have been big challenges around international coordination when it came to the COVID crisis. What examples might have you seen regionally at APAC or at national level that have inspired you? Well, there, there's a lot of examples and hopefully a lot more to come in terms of a cooperation between, uh, you know, nationally or uh, internationally. Uh, I'll give you one example that during the recovery stage, as you know, China's tourism sector has been recovering. Uh, during the early days of recovery, uh, people, the customers uh, are still very hesitant to travel or to buy travel because uh, they, you don't know when there will be some sporadic uh, outbreaks and you have to cancel and you may risk losing uh, your uh, money uh, because not when you have a cancellation, especially with the airlines, uh, you, 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 will, you will lose your down payment or whatever. Uh, but uh, we've been able to successfully work with our suppliers, airlines, hotels, to, to be very innovative to getting these deals. And some of the deals, not only the very, you know, very good discount, but also they are very flexible. They, you can cancel any time without any, uh, you know, it, it, with no reason. Uh, so this kind of innovative uh, product or deals during this recovery stage really help us working with the suppliers to promote these deals and to speed up the recovery of the uh, travel recovery. And that's been uh, you know, cooperation with our suppliers, mostly 
because China has been recovering at first, mostly with uh, Chinese domestic uh, uh, suppliers, but increasingly more uh, to, to regional, uh, hopefully more in the regional level as well. That's a model example. Madam Secretary, can I feel the same question to you? What might have you seen regionally or even in Philippines that has inspired? In the Philippines, um, again, during the start of the pandemic, there were uh, travel restrictions. And as you well know, the Philippines has 7,641 islands. So when there were no more flights available, the Department of Tourism, the Philippine Department of Tourism had to conduct our own sweeper flights. So we paid for it and we made sure that each and every traveler and how, even how far um, the islands were, we made sure that they were able to get home. And we couldn't have done this if not for the help of all the foreign embassies, the work, uh, the help of all the different government agencies. So we all work together. Again, that's Bayanihan at work, Bayanihan spirit, spirit. We all worked together to make sure that all the stranded foreign nationals were able to get home. So that's it how it is in the Philippines. The welfare of the traveling public is a priority and ensuring the safety and welfare of our tourists remain a core objective of the programs carried out by the Philippine Department of Tourism. Fantastic. Thank you. Puneet, if I can come to you, what about in India? Obviously, India has a huge domestic market that has probably made recovery easier compared to those countries which has a huge dependence on international tourism. Um, is it still leisure that's driving recovery while corporate travel is, how do you say, still on the slow lane? So I think um, the shutting down of the international borders made uh, sure that 25 million people from India who are traveling abroad now needed to go out somewhere. So I think that have helped in the recovery of domestic leisure uh, pre-Diwali, that's the festival of lights in India, which you are aware of, but for my fellow panelists, uh, from 15th of November till 15th of March, uh, the domestic travel really helped uh, the hotel sector to start bouncing back. And then the second wave came in and that multiplication in certain states uh, in the number of positive cases has again paralyzed uh, the industry because the pickup has dropped. The occupancies uh, you know, are under stress because cancellations started coming in. And I, I do believe in the short term, leisure will drive the demand. At the middle uh, market segment and at the lower segment, uh, the corporate travel also started. Uh, because uh, mostly people who are 55 and above are senior management or 50 and above. And, and that was more vulnerable to this uh, pandemic. So, so I think uh, in the next six months or so, we'll see demand really being driven by leisure. And uh, as you rightly said, India has a very large base. It's a large population. Uh, so it is uh, in some ways self-reliant in terms of the, the, the domestic market uh, to revive the demand in the sector. Fantastic. I think uh, the, the, the strength of the domestic market is key to mm. all of you speaking here, which is, I, mm. I think, one of the biggest boons of this crisis for Asia Pacific region. Um, uh, Fujita san and uh, Ms. Panzi Ho, I would love to ask both of you um, the same question next, which is obviously, as we move from here to recovery, there will be a need to remove a lot of travel barriers. Could you share from your experience what has been successfully done thus far in Asia Pacific and what more is needed? Um, okay, so maybe I would start first. Yes, please. Um, in Macau, as I had mentioned earlier, we have seen already a pretty good rebound starting in fact, because of the introduction of new policies by China. Um, from last year, uh, starting in Octo uh, October, uh, but it is a gradual opening. So what we now see, it is we, we cannot expect or hope for an, an abrupt kind of you know, transition. We need to see gradual and more patient uh, kind of step-by-step -step approach, and that has proven to be actually uh, reasonable and sustainable. Um, 
Macau has already now had 365 days over one year with zero cases of our own. Uh, so, of course, thanks a lot to our own government and, of course, the community for really working, you know, very hard together. But more importantly, of course, we have the backing of our country, China. But when we start the rebound, not only do we follow step by step all the necessary uh, regulatory kind of guidances, including we now have shared uh, health code that basically will allow for people traveling from China domestically to Macau, which is still considered cross-border, uh, to have now all this shared information. Um, so as you can see, now we can utilize a lot of technology and by way of also sharing resources in uh, infrastructure, I believe, and having really co co coordinated uh, systems uh, in place, now utilizing also, again, you know, uh, high technology to govern the flow of uh, the people. I think that is the way to go. And in fact, right as we speak, Macau has experienced just uh, this month a, the highest, you know, research in terms of uh, travelers, uh, visitors, and we anticipate by end of the year, we will be able to still uh, get back to our um, mid-level kind of travel pattern, which is we hope that we can get to 10 million. Uh, so that is a very, very encouraging example how we actually should be helping each other. I believe to share itineraries, to share infrastructure amongst Asia Pacific is a way to go. Phenomenal statistics right there. Um, Fujita-san, uh, can yes. I ask the same question, please? Okay. Uh, in Asia and Pacific region, which has no regional umbrella organization, such as Europe and North America, so the airlines are collaborating with uh, each other through the uh, association of Asian Pacific Airlines consists of 14 airlines. And in November, this organization with IATA and ACI issued a joint declaration while respecting the position of government that emphasized the importance of controlling the spread of COVID-19 and minimize the social economic impact of the diseases. The airline industry, in cooperation with other stakeholders, has made it clear that it will make effort to ease travel restrictions and reduce the risk of infections. For example, Japan Airlines has also started to try out to uh, demonstrate the use of digital certification in March, according to this declaration. And during the network recovery period from now, there is a possibility that the flight operation will not be fully prepared because many airlines have separated many employees from the company. So I think in terms of airline alliance, like joint business development will be very important uh, near in the future. Uh, we will like to be able to provide service that meets the new uh, preference of customers in other countries by collaborating our respective strengths. So it is very important uh, for uh, the airlines to collaborate together to prepare the safe and secure travel to the customers. Thank you very much. James, speaking of collaboration and easing restrictions, what are your views on um, travel certification as an opportunity for future travel? Do you expect like a global consensus where everyone will agree on the same currency of trust? Or do you expect to see more bilateral or multilateral uh, arrangements? Well, I certainly hope there will be some, uh, you know, globally recognized or agreed on um, process or certification so that each country don't have to negotiate with each other bilaterally. Well, because bilateral negotiations, uh, uh, takes a lot of uh, much longer and could be very political and if, especially smaller destinations will have a hard time to negotiate with big countries. Uh, but uh, globally, uh, we just like you know WTO, if there's a, a international organization such as you know this organization can help the countries uh, come together, agree on some principle and work out a scheme so that every country can participate, that would be the best scenario. Otherwise, it would take much longer. So I think travel certification is a such good idea and it's very um, helpful for the future speeding 
for the speedy recovery of, of, of the global travel industry. Great. Madam Secretary, I saw you shaking your head. Do you agree? Do you have any comments? Um, with me, anything that promotes, facilitates travel is very welcome. In fact, I, I met uh, recently with IATA, and we are in completely in support of IATA. Anything that facilitates travel is welcome. Fantastic. Puneet, if I can bring you in at this point and say, um, you've spoken about the recovery in domestic markets. But India, per se, and the region, Asia-Pacific generally, is still largely close to international travel. What are the key issues in your mind that we need to address, probably in the next six to 12 months, so we can do a reboot on international tourism? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, as some wise people said, crisis, every crisis is an opportunity. This is an opportunity for Asia-Pacific as a region and within that region for certain uh, tourism dependent nations to try to reposition this sector completely. So I think uh, some of the panelists mentioned the whole culture of collaboration, you mentioned it also, is more important now than ever. The government's working together, creating some form of uh, you know, protocols which are uh, common in terms of travel before we open international borders. Uh, in terms of you know, having common policies uh, and taking charge in terms of going plastic free, as an example, in terms of promoting culture, I think uh, uh, we should be very proud of the culture, especially older uh, you know, nations with a very, very old history uh, like India or like others uh, in the region can do that. And I think uh, very important is rebuilding the confidence in travel. I think the confidence in travel needs to be communicated, needs to be advertised, and we need to tell people that it's safe to stay in hotels. The hotels were always clean. Our restaurants were always clean. It's just a pandemic that came and hit us with very infectious, but the places we had are second to none, and they're definitely safer than any other place where you would like to go and stay. So I think we should use the opportunity collectively at the level of UTTC and others to, to reproduce the role of tourism as an employer, as a GDP contributor, as a, one of the most important means of building the culture of tolerance, culture of awareness, and finally, the culture of collaboration. Great. Um, Fujita-san, if, if um, I see you raising your hand, I would love to ask you this, obviously, not only because international travel is so important for Japan Airlines, but you've also been in the news recently, having received the, um, I think the five-star COVID-19 uh, safety rating, uh, which very few can claim, stake the claim to. So please uh, give your views. Okay. Uh, well, the big topics in Japan is Olympics and Paralympic Games scheduled. Uh, to be held this summer. Uh, the game will be held without foreign visitors, unfortunately. Therefore, as many as 90,000 people, both athletes and officials are expected to enter the country. So we are now preparing for those people. We believe that we can move on the next step by implementing specific infection control measures for athletes, families, staff to make the event a success. In order to resume overseas travel, it is necessary to have, uh, to have an adequate inspection system at airport and et cetera. And infection control practice by travelers themselves and enhanced medical system during the stay without which it would be difficult to make the understanding of the receiving side, the customer side also. So the following control will be applied to the entry, exit, and stay of the athletes and related personnel, such as inspection certificate, PCR test on arriving, and download of health monitoring application on their mobiles, submission of a 14 days activity plan, daily health monitoring, including social distance, by ventilation, hand sanitization, and mask use and health observation for 14 days prior to the travel also. These are the very maximum implementation I mentioned. 
but also the basic ex expectation in this uh, method. So there are the keys for the resumption to open the gate to the future. Perfectly clear. Thank you very much. Madam Secretary, if I can um, mm. uh, rope you in at this point in time. Now, we've spoken about vaccination briefly, mm -hmm. but not every government can vaccinate people rapidly. Yeah. Um, and unfortunately, the whole vaccination program has exposed, I, I guess, the deep inequality in the society. Do you see, apart from vaccination, robust testing continuing to play the role of a credible alternative in yes. Philippines yes. and generally in Asia? Yes, um, while vaccination programs, like you said, are still rolling out in different phases, not only in the Philippines, but worldwide, the Philippines remain firm that intensive testing, you are right, is necessary as a temporary means to arrest the spread of the disease if necessary. The focus should be on how to make testing readily available to the larger portion of the population, especially the markets poised to restart traveling. This could very well boost traveler confidence and support domestic tourism resurgence and can later on usher in the reopening of borders to the international markets. Relative to this, I'm glad that the tourism frontline workers in airports and quarantine hotels have already been included in the priority list of the government's COVID-19 immunization program. At present, at present, we are already coordinating to include other tourism workers. It is indeed, indeed critical for our frontliners, especially those who continue to man our ports of entry and those who serve at an accommodation establishment that have been repurposed as quarantine facilities mm -hmm. to be um, uh, vaccinated. Protection through the vaccine and healthcare support systems will primarily boost their immune system and more importantly, fortify their mental and emotional core to continue working under these conditions. Fantastic. Um, James, uh, obviously the effective containment of the pandemic in China meant domestic business really rebounded, especially in Q4. I've read multiple interviews of yours. Um, and I read now recently how with the Kingming Festival, bookings really went through the roof uh, in the beginning of April. What difference are you seeing in business versus uh, leisure demand as it re returns in the region um, and generally in China as well? Oh yeah, uh, there are quite a few changes in the travel business uh, post-COVID in uh, China. Uh, I think that's probably typical around the world too. Um, for example, bigger groups is uh, uh, turning to small groups. Uh, but for business travel, I think the key change is that a lot of uh, conference events you know, like this one is being changed to uh, virtual meetings. So actually that releases a lot of uh, inventory and uh, uh, asking for you know extra demand uh, from uh, the, the 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 travel market. So for the for example, hotels used to be like the higher hotel, 20, 30 percent of their business is meetings and events. Now it's a much smaller number. Uh, that actually is an opportunity for leisure tourism operators uh, to like. Like us, uh, we, we've been focusing on FIT travelers and other leisure type, uh, high-end leisure travelers, small groups as well. So actually that creates extra opportunities for us to market these inventories. And uh, for, for high-end luxury tour operators, so that's also a very good opportunities because uh, you know airlines and hotels were willing to give very good discount, very good deals uh, to attract those uh, customers who uh, in normal years, they will actually travel to international destination. Now they're looking for domestic luxury products. Fantastic. And I have to say, it's been very inspirational seeing you leading from the front, coming up with innovative solutions like your video streaming, um, your live streaming uh, dressed in the traditional attire, which has been, uh, I think uh, it will be not enough to say it has been a big hit. You've become an internet star of sorts uh, with that. So uh, well done on that. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's right. That's, that's a very good uh, opportunity to uh, have some uh, innovation in, in, in sales marketing and in, in those, those products, including live streams. We've been you know, 
very good uh, uh, make, making very good sales for our live stream shows. Wonderful. We have about five minutes left. I want to go to Puneet first and then I started with, with Pan Panziho. I will finish with her. Uh, and I'd love to get some comments from all the panelists on um, on a quick closing note. But Puneet, if I can ask you, I know we still have many uncertainties still clouding given the pandemic situation and the road to recovery. One thing we know is that it's going to be long, but we need to build back better. And from that perspective, what do you think we need to ensure that recovery, when it happens, will be sustainable and inclusive in Asia Pacific. And I'll come back to you, Ms. Ho, because I know this is something you feel very passionately about. Puneet, you first. I think I, I said it before, Radna, this is an opportunity for the industry globally, because no other industry has been as hit as tourism, hospitality, aviation has been. So. It's, a, it's an opportunity to reimagine ourselves in all possible ways and creating an all stakeholders uh, value proposition. So, and that's the only way out of it. So of course the vaccinations will help. Of course, having COVID passports will help. So which make ease of travel possible, but generally creating that interest in tourism, tapping on that basic human need to travel tapping on the potential of creating more awareness, building on the culture, building on the theme of resilience. Uh, I think this will pay off. I think uh, WTTC has been doing uh, a very good job and relentless efforts. And I think we just need to make sure that the regional chapters, starting from, let's say in Asia Pacific, to a national chapter like, like India works, you know, in very, very close, uh, touch so that the messaging is very precise, is very clear and very pointed. We can't have a laundry list of 20 things we want to do. Let's get a message of five key themes that we will use or seven key themes throughout the globe. And let's all go for it in the real culture of collaboration and make it happen in our own regions. Very well said. Ms. Ho, if I can feel this to you now, because I know you really feel about this topic. Yes. Well, in my opinion, I, I agree, first of all, you know, uh, on all the things that uh, Punit had been talking about in terms of bringing in all the stakeholders. And here, I think I'd like to even extend it farther to say that the stakeholders in the traditional sense would always be casted as the government uh, and the major corporations, the investors. Here, in fact, after the pandemic, we begin to see that we are all in this together, um, including even the employees including even our citizens, because the people who are living in the cities, they might hate at times, you know, how the tourism uh, arrivals are, you know, maybe potentially disrupting some of the, the, the uh, sanctuary and, 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 and the tranquility and so on. But when you don't have them, you also will feel the pain. You also will realize that, you know, you're losing also a great part of the makeup of your own city you know, identity and how you differentiate from each other and how, in fact, when we keep talking about culture, how then we want to utilize tourism as the best, you know, platform and basis to also express our own cultural, you know, kind of offerings. So I think this is a good moment that we can reposition and to break in, to bring in everybody. We want our employees to be the best ambassadors, we want our own citizens to themselves vouch that we, you know, to cry out, we want tourists, we want friends, we want them to come back and appreciate what we do and also to exchange views. We have suffered the same way as you all had. So this is a good, you know, basis. And I think with that, this is all about humanity and, and really, you know, the, 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 the longest, um, you know, kind of concept about, Tourism. In Chinese, we have a, a saying, by the way, that, you know, you learn more uh, from traveling um, mm -hmm. a thousand miles than you read 10,000 books. So I think this still maintains. And this is what I would still want to advocate, you know, Fantastic. give very ourselves wise. a chance. Very, very wise counsel. I think we have about three minutes to go and I would love to get very quick words, uh, starting with Madam Secretary, please. Yeah. One tip before we go, 
Can you share your one tip very quickly, 30 seconds only, on how can we build traveler confidence and accelerate recovery in Asia Pacific and the world, really, because okay. the world looks to Asia Pacific? Yeah, very quick. Um, with, with regard to the re region, I think to boost co confidence in travel, the region has been constantly updating the world. So it's very important um, with social media marketing and maximizing the potentials of digital tourism. Now, I'm also happy to share that the Philippines became the 100th destination to get the safe travel stamp. So being given the safe travel stamp means it's safe to travel in the country. So also uniform travel protocols. So Wonderful. yeah, we, yes, that's, that's all. Thank you. Great. Uh, Fujita san uh, if I can ask you your last words on how to build traveler confidence, because we need the people to travel again. Okay, uh, in this crisis, only what we had prepared was useful. And what we had prepared was not enough. So the important thing is not to open the border only, but we have to design the new travel industries after the COVID-19, safe and security travel, digitalization and business and vacation together. So those new designs uh, requested for our travel industries to manage the world in the future. Wonderful. Uh, I see uh, James on my screen next, and then Puni, then we'll finish with Ms. Kamziho. Yeah, my, my tip will be, you can be very creative during the recovery stage, because as I said, the travel industry is permanently changed. You know, for example, smaller groups, uh, you know, short trips, and also a lot of, you know, staycations, um, and a lot of uh, high-end, uh, domestic high-end travelers. So yeah, so innovations like live streaming, staycation, you know, a lot of things you can experiment and be creative. Wonderful. Puneet. Yeah, I think I would join everyone in saying safe travel is one thing, but communicate happy travel. People as families or as groups using digital as a medium, showing how happy they were and how safe they felt. Wonderful. Ms. Pansy Ho. I think it's safe to say that, you know, all the world over, in fact, we now do see that there is a huge pent up travel need. You know, mm -hmm. everybody wants to and needs to, by the way, you know, do some sort of traveling for whether it's personal business or even just basically, you know, having a chance uh, going back to having good, just, you know, playing good times and moments shared with friends and families. So, Let's just all come together and for, for once put away all the differences in terms of whose system is better than whose. More, what's more important is we all need to work towards a consolidation uh, of all the best ideas out there. And then to make sure that we can all share in on this. The world has no boundaries and borders. So is also how the travel industry you know, should be acting together. Thank Wonderful. Some amazing learning and wise counsel in there. Ladies and gentlemen, we have run out of time. I'm getting reminders and reminders. It's time to say goodbye, but not before I say my heartfelt thanks to all of you for your amazing contributions. This was a masterclass in Asia's path to recovery. And whilst uncertainties remain, I think personally for me, listening to you, I leave today even more optimistic. I'm emboldened and I'm sure everyone will be listening to you. I wish you, your organizations and your countries all the very, very best. And I'm convinced that we will get past this most of all, because we have solutionaries and leaders such as you in charge dealing with it. Thank you all. Thank you all very, very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you.